Welcome to 52 Miniatures, my name is Alex and this video is sponsored by Corvus Belly. In this video we're taking a look at tabletop wargame Warcrow. What is Warcrow is something that I'll be trying to answer in this video. I'll be taking a look at the setting, painting up the miniatures in the starter box and playing a game, hopefully giving you an idea of what Warcrow is all about. And so, another epic tale from the hobby realm. This is Lindworm, home of all manner of fantastical creature, together with orcs, elves, dwarves, man and reanimated flesh creatures. We'll be spending the next 20 or so minutes here. I'm glad I brought a map and some coffee. Restlessness plagues this land and its inhabitants, the ebb and flow of magic and ambition. Oh, and an annoying red fog that potentially could turn you inside out. If only everyone could just get along, we could have a nice lovely game of solitaire or something. As so happens, everyone dislikes pretty much everyone else and so instead we have a war game. Several races and factions fight for what is right, uh, from their perspective, inevitable disaster. Magic, muscle and steel. And a lot of skirmishes to get through. As of the release of this video, Warcrow is an all new game and the first release contains everything one needs to play an introductory game. We have two factions, the Orcs, or Nordic tribes if you will, kind of like nomadic Viking Orcs, and the hegemony of Embersig, a sort of Imperium type faction of humans and other five finger races like dwarves and elves. Elves have five fingers, right? The box also contains dice, markers, tokens, stat sheets, cardboard style terrain and a rule book. A game in a box. I'm all set to paint up the miniatures in the box and attempt a first game. Warcrow, that's the name of Lindworm's Moon by the way, is a miniature tabletop war game of sort of medium size. A full size game requires about 15 to 20 miniatures per side. Plays on a 3 foot by 3 foot table and takes 1 to 2 hours to play depending on scenario, rule knowledge and dice rolls. The miniatures are plastic and rather neat sculpts. The humans are sculpted with less exaggerated features than what we usually get in fantasy. This is more of a true scale style. The orcs have a bit more of an intelligent look uh, for orcs. I spoke to Hupu, games designer and Warcrow expert over at Corvus Belly, and she confirmed that there is pretty much a 50-50 concept going. Each faction is a half and half mix of male and female troops. There are, as with all molded miniatures, some mold lines and cleanup to deal with, surprisingly well hidden on the humans, more scraping on the orcs. I mainly used a snap blade knife to clean everything up and assembled using superglue. The one miniature that needed some extra attention was this orc hero model. I used epoxy putty, green stuff and or milliput as gap filler for some of the gaps that needed to be addressed. And successfully poked at it until it took the vague shape of fur. The warcrow setting is vast. I'm intrigued by the extent of world building that has taken place. Hupu told me that the game, model design, mechanics and setting has been in the works for many years. I mean there's 300 pages of lore to dig into in the main warcrow book. And so these models' future skirmishes could take place not only for a number of story-based reasons, they could also take place in any location, rugged, lush, deserted, populated, underground, maybe even in the clouds. I decided to honour the stories and location of the starter set, Winds from the North, with the mood for snow and icy winds. Creating rocky earth bases, a texture paste and some bits of cork bark to substitute as rocks that I'll paint up a little wintry at the end of this video. And so here's the start of the promised fight to come. At this stage I think they're just whispering insults to each other, like prized fighters during the weigh-in. I enjoy the model's style and this is just the start of what's to come. Uh, we have six different nations. We have the Hegemony of Ambers, we have the Orcs and the Varang, which are the Northern Tribes, and then we have the Sienan, the Wood Elves, Feudum, which is the Knights and Priestesses Kingdoms, Worshippers of the Moon, which are all humans. Then we have Mount Haven, Kingdom of Dwarves. And then we also have the Science of Yalaval, 
Charles are known as the best faction in the whole game because they took magic to another level. Okay, so plenty of models to come, but for now, let's paint what we've got. I divided this painting part of the video into some different types of tips rather than in-depth start-to-finish paint jobs. I think the box art miniatures are awesomely painted, yet I'd love to see how these minis would look in a swifter, not as pro style. And that's where I come in. First I want to get some nice metal armour going. The Black Legion troopers of the hegemony are predominantly strutting about in their fancy plate mail, and so here's a tip for some characteristic metal. For this, the best start is with a black base coat. I'm using a darker metallic paint, a magnesium, the equivalent of something like a gun metal perhaps, as well as straight silver. I've got a little piece of sponge that I've shaped into a little bit of a flat tipped stamp that should be able to reach into most places on the mini. I dip it in the magnesium paint, remove the worst excess on a piece of tissue and then lightly stamp the miniature's raised areas. Trying to retain as much of the black in the recesses as possible. The sponge creates a nice random texture, sort of replicating brushed steel or something. After that, I take some silver paint on a flat brush, wipe off excess paint on a tissue, and then carefully brush silver paint only on the most raised bits on the metal armor. Not everywhere, just kind of where the sun would shine. Some of the decorations in the armor I go over with a thin gold paint. I want a little bit of detail going without too much time spent on each miniature, so I pick out a distinct pattern here and there without bogging down too much in intricacy. This characterful metallic surface is now something that we can tint with the help of transparent type paints like inks or contrast style paints. I've got some army painter speed paints here, a dark mossy green for the silver and a warm flesh tone for the gold. The dark green smooths over the silver giving it a darker yet more interesting and a little painterly look. The peachy paint on the gold warms it up and adds some depth to crevices and such. One can take this any direction wanted, a cooler blue tone on the silver or a red tone on the gold, for example. This unit of bucklermen are predominantly armoured and so starting with all the metals like this is the efficient path. After, it's a matter of personal taste as to how much effort should be put into the remaining details. I think these are sculpted to suit different paint styles and can be painted to a high standard as well as something like my simpler approach. I decided, probably because I was watching the epic HBO series Rome while painting, to give the hegemony a Roman legion style. A mighty empire with Linworm's only professional army. So leather and red will be pretty much the rest of the scheme. And skin tones, but I mean that's pretty much leather and red too. Building up the red included an unnecessary amount of steps, but this was pretty much just what ended up happening as I was not very happy with the pink nature of the army paint of red paint. As you can see the remaining models are primed white. This is because I'm going to attempt a common approach nowadays, which makes me sound like an old man I know, but I'm going to use contrast style paints. Something I almost never do. I kind of just don't like it. But I thought it would be interesting to see what these orcs would look like when painted up by plebs. Uh, no offense. Uh, I was just watching Rome, remember? I also want to share not only insults, but some contrast style painting tips as well. After the white prime, I sprayed the miniatures with pink, uh, that's plebeian for magenta, from underneath. This will tint all my contrast paints in the shaded areas on the model. This could alternatively be done by dry brushing the same areas lightly with a pink. Honestly, any kind of color shenanigans pre-contrast paint is great if it's tinting the shadows like this or doing a two-tone zenithal prime or something. This pink will, for example, change my green contrast paint to more of a brown. Alternatively, use a cool tone like a turquoise. That would be another great alternative. The next little trick is to mix contrast style paints on the model while they're wet. Wet blending with contrast paints, if you will. I'm using a muted green and a pink speed paint for the orc skin. On the model, I add some pink to the areas where I want a pale brown to yellow to reddish tint. Sounds a little weird perhaps, but it's kind of colour theory. Red and green makes brown. 
And so mixing the two paints on the miniature makes for some pretty interesting variations, especially in combination with the pink underspray. This is not only reserved for skin of course, but it's a pretty good example of what a little contrast paint wet blending can achieve. Now I painted up the rest of the miniatures with contrast style speed paints without any fancy blending shenanigans, just straight paint. I have reasons for this. I want to show what the orcs look like in a suitably accessible get minis on the table style. This is what a lot of armies on tabletops look like. And because this gives me a reason to explain why I kind of don't enjoy this look. Uh, again, no offense. And thus, it forces me to show you how I solve my own imagined problems. Because, I mean, they might possibly be your imagined problems too. Also, apologies if you're here interested in Warcrow and you've never painted a miniature before. But this kind of video content will make perfect sense if you stick around for a few years and paint a few miniatures. For now, just keep watching and pretend that all this makes perfect sense. You might as well subscribe and hit the like button as well for good measure. Uh, thanks. Anyway, my issue with contrast style paints is twofold. One, it is a bit weird and slightly elitist, perhaps. Uh, most of the time, because of the lack of brushwork, there is very little personality from the painter involved in the paint job. It's got a very generic look. Can't be helped, really. Secondly, my shivers come from a colour perspective. Mainly one paint is used for each section on the mini, resulting in a shadow, mid-tone and highlight of the same colour and hue. This is not as common when painting with opaque paints. There might be a black wash in the crevices or cool blue base tones with warm blue highlights. Whatever. And I don't know. that The one colour contrast thing just looks flat and non-coherent to my eye. My quick solution is to add a unifying shadow. To me, this makes the different blocks of colour weld together, creating something more personal and characteristic. I'm not using a transparent paint, not a wash, just a regular opaque paint thinned down with quite a lot of water. And I quite unceremoniously start applying it to some of the recesses and some of the areas facing the base of the miniature. Not everywhere, but where it feels good. Thin, sloppy layers on top of thin, sloppy layers, building up sort of gradients of a cool blue tone. The result is up to you to decide if it's worth the step, but to me, all of a sudden, we've got some love going and it's not just factory output. The second more complicated solution is, of course, choice highlights with opaque paints. Touching up important parts with some bold yet effective paintwork. Like some highlights on the skin, scratches on the leather, fabric and wear on the cloth. The kind of stuff that contrast style paints don't really do. This can of course all get out of hand, taking too much time, resulting in no reason for the contrast style paint to start with. Often what happens to me, and honestly probably the main reason I don't use them much. Painting the red pants on the hegemony didn't take me much longer than the pants on the orcs in the end. But maybe this is a me problem. Anyway, some painting tips out of the way, only the base is left to paint, but no time right now. My friend Carl was knocking on my door ready to test play a game, and I was looking forward to this part. Carl is a great gamer, and together we form quite a good pair of playtesters. Experienced and wait. What just happened? What rule? Gaming. The later would be me. The starter set comes with a simple set of terrain, something I really enjoy. It also comes with a lot of tokens and stuff. At first I thought this was all a bit over the top, but realized after playing that it's much like the same kind of tools I use to remember what's going on when playing other games, like hand-scribbled notes or little dice for wounds and so on. Only specially designed in cardboard token form for Warcrow. I've mentioned this in the past when talking about war games. I don't think any war game is simple. It's in a way not the point of a war game. We're dealing with a very specialized product, like expecting that an expensive sports car has a weird transmission and annoying safety belts. Your war game will come with lots of rules that take time to get accustomed to. It's what we paid for. Especially jumping into a new ecosystem will take time just to understand how things are explained and described. Every company has its own language, so to speak. Within the world of wargaming, games can of course be more or less complex. And so, me and Carl spent the obligatory first hour with our noses in books trying to figure out the new rules. 
With that said, Warcrow does seem to try and ease the point of entry for previously non-converted wargamers slightly, making, say, the jump from board games to wargames a little smoother than some other games. The visual style layout with cards, tokens, counters and custom dice makes a lot of sense in this regard, visual representations of your options. Instead of having to remember that, say, your hero has a 2 plus buff against greenskins if there's a friendly magician within 8 inches of an enemy totem on a rainy day, you can just put the little token on your figure's stat card. Maybe not favoured by die-hard Puritans, but hey, just look what happened to Rome in the end. The initial starter box scenario concept is also an utter entry-level playthrough experience. Smaller games introducing more complex rules as one plays through. Our first game, for example, the first scenario in the starter campaign played without magic. Now, while me and Carl play a game that ended with Carl winning but without a single death, I'd like to talk about the points of interest we found along the way what makes the game stand out for us and thus hopefully conveys a little of what Warcrow is about. Warcrow is a small army style game playing with small units of troops, hero characters and single model specialist units, like mages and healers. It kind of feels like playing a skirmish style game yet with units instead of single miniatures. Gameplay is favorably played through scenarios. The scenario dictates how long the game is and how to score points. Scoring points can, for example, be to hold a specific point on the board. This is how we played the game without casualties. Carl held an important point on the map and the scenario ended after round two, before we'd had time to start chopping bits off. Mind you, this was a first learning scenario, but regardless, this endorses strategy and storytelling as well as keeps a time limit to the games. Warcrow plays with custom dice. This confused me at first, but I've come to not only accept, but enjoy this fact. Realizing again that when you're playing, quote, what you see is what you get, unquote, there's no need for constant mathematical calculations. Simply put, there are attack dice and defense dice. If you roll three attack symbols and I only roll two shield symbols, you hit me with one hit. Your trooper will, as stats, have dice symbols instead of numbers, again taking the mathematical feel out of the gaming experience. The game plays with alternating activations. This means I do one thing, you do one thing, back and forth. Together with something called face-to-face rolls and switches. Essentially every altercation is solved by both players rolling dice simultaneously with the option to switch certain dice rolls. This means the gameplay feels like one game played together and not uh, now it's your turn, I'll go get a drink and maybe call my mum, let me know when it's my turn, uh, which is surprisingly common for some reason. Each game is played with a turn counter. Not only can this be used to keep track of the duration of magic spells and such, it can also hold events decided by the scenario. This can be a snowstorm suddenly hitting the battlefield making movement more difficult for some, a monster suddenly appearing on the battlefield attacking at random, or the appearance of the red fog, the mysterious fog that pesters Lindworm. You can Mm. have events regarding climate events regarding the narrative of a scenario, something particular that's occurring only there, Mm. you can have an event that says, boom, now you need to take out these two objectives. Why? Ah, that? Mm. Earthquake or whatever, yeah. Exactly. These events are great additions to gameplay, both out of a narrative aspect, but also out of a let's play a fun game perspective. Now, the first game resolved surprisingly fast, and we need to get to the next shortly, but we'll end here with a last little painting tip, painting some very simple winter-style bases. For the bases not already primed black, I paint black, and then brush on a rather vivid blue. This is Imperial Navy from Army Painter. I use a flat brush with limited amount of paint in and sort of overbrush, slightly stroking the brush over the black, coloring most raised areas, leaving some black in the recesses, kind of like very wet dry brushing. I then dry brush with a light grey on top of that. This is ash grey, again going for the most raised areas, leaving both blue and black underneath. Then, on just a few choice parts, a little dry brush of a pale sand colour, ancient stone. 
And finally, a selective dusting of some dirt brown dry pigment powder. This adds a nice warm brown contrast, really making the rest of the base look like frozen tundra or something. After a varnish, these are all ready for another game with Carl. While we take a long last look at the minis, there are some more things that need to be said about Warcrow. By the way, I've got two minis left to paint, but I'm saving these for future fun. Anyway, Warcrow rules are free to download and a free list builder app is in the works. As of the release of this video, there is only one way to get into Warcrow by buying the starter box. So there's no rush for the list builder just yet. The starter box, however, is one of the best get into this game and start playing starter boxes I've encountered, regardless of sponsors. Corvus Belly has been working on this game for many years. I asked Hoppo what she was working on for Warcrow right now. For example, so my work, for instance, what I was doing today, it's planned to be released like within a year. Yeah. Even further than that. So you yeah. can see how much work we have advanced to keep on bringing miniatures, profile scenarios, narrative campaigns. We're very excited about the project. Yeah, cool. We've seen that there are several factions to be released and a multitude of miniatures to be released. A lot to look forward to. This and is the first box, and then a month after, another box will come, which is an expansion to these litter box. And um, it includes another three miniatures per army, so that's a total of six. And from that moment onward, monthly, you will have uh, new miniatures for both armies, for the Northern Tribes and uh, the Hegemony of Umbrasig. Yeah. And then over time, a new faction will be released and that faction would also have their own, you know, newer stuff and they will be combined in time and maybe new battle boxes. And yeah. right. All of that stuff you're much. hiding behind, behind that green blanket. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yes. <laughs> I do like the look of a lot of the miniatures and this kind of fantasy is fun and the scarps have their own unique style. A random favorite are the special characters like doctors, tattooists, Aoidios musicians, uh, memorialists, and so on. In a way, non-combat troops with special abilities that to me show some of the flavor this game enforces. I perceive the gameplay as full-fledged war game complexity that brings aboard a lot of storytelling and alternative ways to play games beyond I kill you when you kill me. The visual nature of dice and tokens helps a gamer like me, one who is baffled by maths and that just wants to get on with the game. For some reason, what looks distracting is in fact the opposite. In the end, I'm very happy about the look of my vastly superior Empire soldiers. I look forward to playing through the rest of the scenarios in the starter. But the orcs turned out okay. Um, in hindsight, I think I would have liked them a bit darker, a little more grim, like the true cold north wind of probable death they are. Maybe a black metal armor would have looked good on them too. Anyway, please let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you to Corvus Belly for sponsoring this video. Thank you dearly to my patrons and thank you for watching. I hope the video has answered a few questions about Warcrow and if you have any more, please just ask them in the comments. I will do my very best to answer them. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.